This episode brought to you by Peter Wood's Museum of the Impossible. What's a Museum of the Impossible? It's going to be like Harry Potter meets Ripley's Believe It or Not. It'll be a -a one-of-a-kind, themed, interactive space where people can experience the impossible. But I need your help. To get the project started, I've set up a Patreon over at museumoftheimpossible.com. If you're able to throw a few bucks my way each month, we can build it together. Thanks for your support, and I can't wait to welcome you into the Museum of the Impossible. Welcome to the podcast of the impossible. I'm Peter Wood, and my guest this episode is the producer of Magic Above Standard, a magical monthly showcase in Philadelphia that features the best of the best. That's right, I'm talking about the one and only Lindsay Noel. Hello. Welcome again. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for Thanks for having me back. It's been it's been a minute. It's, it's, it's it, been nice. No, it's literally, yeah, it's literally been a minute. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I, uh, I I looked a little bit into Magic Above Standard uh, just to be able to chat about it, but I wanted to hear your sort of, you know, start with maybe the elevator pitch, like what's the one sentence version of it, but then I would love to hear sort of how that came about. Uh, so the, I guess the elevator pitch, the one sentence is uh, the tagline I write for the event is this isn't your grandfather's magic show. This is magic above standard Okay, where we're not just bringing you the impossible. We're changing what it looks like. That's cool. Okay. So the idea behind the show is that I wanted there to be a regular magic show in Philadelphia proper because we have a theater near Philadelphia, but not in Philadelphia. So I wanted something that happened actually in the city. Um, I also wanted to produce something so that I could host it. I wanted to host a show where I get to bring people the kind of magic that made me get back, get into magic as an adult. Okay. Right. So I wanted people to see the kind of magic that I saw when I first saw Francis in 2014 and went, totally magic can be right. Right. Cool. It can be funny. It can be smart. It can be all these things that I hadn't, associated with magic up until I saw Francis do it that way. Nice. Okay. And so fast forward to September of 2022 and I was leaving May's uh, Magicians Alliance of the Eastern Seaboard. I think that stands for. Oh, yes. M-A-E-S. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. M-A-E-S. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, we were going home. It was me, Francis Minotti and Meadow Perry. Okay. And we stopped for brunch. Actually, I have a place I love to go to that was closed Mm. randomly. Like it was 1130 on a Sunday. So like they should have been open for brunch, but they weren't. Right. So standard tap is right near there and they have an outdoor seating. And I was like, you know what guys, let's let's go here. If I remember correctly, they have great food. Oh, a minute. So we go for brunch. The food's amazing. It's beautiful. Francis goes to the bathroom and he comes back and he's like, Lindsay, we should, you should do a show here. Like this is, <laughs> And I go, no, Francis, I don't want to do a show in a bar. I want right. to do a show in like a real space. He's like, it's really pretty. I think you're going to change your mind. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Right. And then as we're leaving, we went, we had come in one way. So I hadn't seen this thing he was talking about. Mm. But out the other way through the other part of the upstairs of Sandra Tepp. And there is this gorgeous proscenium. Wow. And then there is gold sparkle curtains and red velvet on each side. And it's just beautiful. It's like, it's going to be like 12, 10 feet across. Okay. And it's just in this upstairs dining room with this gorgeous natural light hitting. I was like, what? Wow. We should do a show here. <laughs> like, wow. Thank you for listening to me. Right. Right. Appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so. I immediately was like, who do I talk to? And I set up a meeting and uh, we started the show monthly okay. on November 16th of 2022. Okay. And a lot of times when I'm doing something new, I, I tend to work with friends and people I like and people that will be understanding if it goes a little bit weird. Sure. Uh, it was amazingly successful, but the people I had do the first one were uh, Francis Minotti and uh, Randy Shine, who's a good friend. Of ours. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Um, and also, like that's just a that's just a really great magic show. Yeah. Like, that, no one's gonna be mad at seeing that magic show. Sure. So, yeah. uh, Randy right. headlined, and Francis was our feature act, and uh, 
It's a monthly show now. It's been super successful and wonderful. Uh, I've been bringing in magicians from all over. Awesome. I've had uh, Paige Thompson and Louise Carrion from the Chicago Magic Lounge. Yeah. Uh, ben Barnes as well from the Chicago Magic Lounge has come out to do it. Alex Hilshi. I've got Mark Clearview coming for the first time in June. I'm really excited about. Right. And just like a lot of people. So basically, oh, Felice Ling, who does uh, the Boston Magic Lab, highly recommend uh, checking out. Her magic is great. Uh-huh. Uh, she's she's great. The show she puts on is great. Um, yeah, basically just a bunch of people that I know are really good and would go over really well mm-hmm. with a bar crowd. Also, I'm really effectively trying to make a show that says magic isn't for kids. This is a cool date night. Right, right. Totally. Come, come out and hang out and have a, have a really nice, uh, I mean, standard taps food is like top notch great. Awesome. Um, they have wonderful drinks, wonderful staff. Everyone who works there is amazing. Uh, I, I love doing the show there. And we're trying to do something that is uh, not just a magic show, but like an immersive magic thing. So it's not just the show on stage with me hosting and a feature and a headliner. It's also tableside magic. Oh, okay. Um, Francis does... Uh, if he's not on running, if he's not performing on stage, he does the sound, which isn't a ton of sound, but a little bit of sound stuff. And then he also does strolling magic for the hour before the show begins okay. and in intermission. Um, so there's magic happening from the time you get there to the time you leave. And it's, it's really, it's intimate. The space only seats up to, if you really crammed everyone in 38 people. Oh, nice. That's a great size. Yeah. But wonderful size. The room is great. We built a stage for it. Okay. Um, Francis and our dear friend Alda, uh, she comes to every show. We no longer charge her money. <laughs> she's, she's been to every single one of them, and I'm just like, you awesome. Just the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's one of my good friends. So at a point, you're like, I don't want your money anymore, friend. I love you. Just, just show up. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but she and Francis uh, built a stage back in January. Okay. Uh, to, and it, it's amazing. Uh, we had to build it to the specs of the owner to flip up and hide. Uh, okay. So, when they're doing brunch or when it's not the for the 29 days of, of the month where there's not a magic show happening. Yeah. The stage is visible. Well, what did uh, they, what, what was this for? Like what, the, the curtains that Francis saw, what were they doing in that space previously? They occasionally, very occasionally were hosting a drag brunch. Oh, and it was, okay. They had done like three of them and the owner was just kind of into it and was like, let's make it look nice. So they put those curtains up. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um, Interesting. But they don't really, I think that stopped happening or they just do it. Like, I don't know. They just don't do it as frequently anymore. Um, but, and it's funny because when their show was called Above Standard Drag. Okay. And because literally, I think people, when I first came out with the show, had a feeling about it that were like, oh, why is she calling her show? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because literally Above Standard Tab. Right. Sure. So, and yep. then also secretly, I'm only hiring very good magicians. So it is magic above standard. I don't care. People can be mad if they want. No, I mean, you, you can, you can, re, you can always lean on the fact, right? Like you, you have the facts to back you up, but uh, it's a, it's a fine title because of the quality that you're bringing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have met a bunch of amazing magicians that are willing to come do the show. Like the, yeah. it's hard. Like even it's uh, January, uh, not January, June will be the, eighth show yeah the eighth show that sounds about Um, right since november yeah yes so it'll be the eighth show and the list of magicians i've had come already is incredible like it's i'm i'm excited that we've been able to bring these people there's people lined up basically through the end of 2023 to do it yeah um and they're all people that i am just so thrilled about and also uh one of the things that i've been doing with that show specifically is designing vintage magic posters. Right. Yeah, I've seen these. Those are awesome. So so you're doing those? I do them, yes. Okay. They take me a long time. Yeah. Um, usually the average is, I'm going to say they're about 12 hours a poster. Dang, wow. Okay. Uh, and it's because I am taking them and individually painting over the people. Like, So I take, the way it works is, I take a vintage magic poster that exists. Uh, right. I have that passion book of the magic posters yep yeah and 
or I search online for ones that are just out there. And then I take the magician out of it. I take elements out of them. And then I take elements out of other posters and other, other illustrations. Mm. I then have to paint over the images I'm sent from the magicians and then turn them into a paint, like turn the pictures into paintings. Right. Then that painting I've turned it into blend into the poster that already like, so it's sure. a lot of like texture recreation and, um, uh, psychotic trackpad painting because i i've had real design so i say i'm not a real graphic designer uh-huh. uh, because i just started doing it because i had to because i realized i didn't have the money to pay someone to do this sure so and i was going to be really particular i knew i knew when i started this i was going to be particular about it yeah so the level of of particularness i would bring to the table I, there's no way i was ever going to make enough money off of this show that can only see 38 people right, right. deal with the pain in the butt. I knew I was going to be about it. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. So, you know, um, but it's, I, I sit there with the computer like up on my knees uh-huh. and then I, have, I zoom in like 300% and I just, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, <laughs> I'm getting procreate. I'm getting, listen, I'm getting procreate. It's the show is going to be going on for a, for, a foreseeable future i'm just yeah. gonna i'm investing in procreate a new ipad <laughs> there you go we well, are yeah, what about like have you ever used one of the tablets like the wacom tablet whatever they're called wacom um with um, like a stylus no i mean I, that's essentially what i plan to do with the procreate okay right? like, sure. I'm gonna get the procreate and i will draw the pictures of the people beforehand or whatever element i need to put in and then and then right put it in. but um yeah it's it started out as something I was like, well, this would be kind of fun. And now they get, they're getting more involved each time too. Like the one I did oh, yeah. pages piece was that took me, that was a, that was a hard one. Right. It's probably my favorite one yet. Um, and it's funny cause I look back at the one I did in November when I started the show mm. and when I first did it. I was like, man, this is so good. I did such did a really great job, but I look at it now and I'm like, I want to have Randy back and put him on another poster. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. I feel like I've improved at how I do it. So no, and that, that's going to be such a cool um, artifact to have from how the show progresses and to have a poster from each, each month. Uh, yeah. That'll be neat. And especially that it's digital. So that way you can, you can easily, you know, share it and also keep it, you know, if you pull, it's easy to pull it back out in 20 years and look at it uh, as opposed to a, a, a physical painting on the wall, you know? Right. Yeah. And I do, I mean, I do keep a physical, Oh, I also get them custom. I don't take them to a print shop. I uh-huh. have a mine. Actually, she's, she is when I, when I hire someone to do graphic design, it's who I hire okay. um, Bridget. Licato. I want to name her Bridget. Okay. I design many magicians need logo work done. She did the logo for Lindsay Noel magic for Francis Minotti magic and for a couple of magicians and also uh, the bubble verse with me and Meadow Perry. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. She, Amazing. It, it, Incredible, but she is a great uh, large scale printer. So nice. in order to keep them with that vintage look, so they don't have the sheen of them on them, the way like printed posters do these days, I have her print them in her at home printer. So they're like, the, they have the right texture and everything. Right. And so it's like a canvas sort of material, like, like a, like a textured. It's, it's not, it's, it's regular paper, uh-huh. but it's, it's fully matte. Oh, okay. Modern printing tends to not have a matte finish. Right. I got you. So that's why I go through her. Just a photo mat. And then, then, then that poster is on display at uh, standard tap. Like it, it is it there yeah. sort of to announce the show in advance or how does that work? And, yeah. And I also, um, this is something I talk about. Uh, I'm working on a lecture about hosting and producing and marketing mm-hmm. a show and kind of creating your own space to do a show in. And uh, one of the things I, I believe in deeply that, falls by the wayside in this digital age is going around and physically hanging up posters and telling people about your magic. Right. Right. Your event, right. That's not something anyone does anymore. Right. And so when you see a poster and you can like, you know where like that's it, it hits differently than a, than an Instagram or a Facebook ad. Yeah. No, t- I mean, it is funny. We're sort of coming back around to like nowadays when I get a piece of paper in the mail, it is more of a rare thing than an email. Right. So so you're it's almost like print 
and maybe not magazines and, and newspapers, but a lot of print marketing is coming back and is more popular because yeah. we're so swamped digitally. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. Inundated with digital information at every turn of our yeah. existence, especially with work from home being so much more popular now. Yeah, uh, sure. It, it's, it goes a long way to have a physical in-person marketing element. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I would love to talk about Fool Us. Uh, you were on season eight of the show, right? Um, I wanted to sort of hear more about what the inspiration was for for hopping, to, you know, for throwing your hat into that ring and then sort of what your, but, you know, the I, I obviously, I'm sure we could talk about it for hours, but sort of your, your takeaways, I guess. Oof. Uh, well, I just, I wanted to, like most people that are entertainers, I, I wanted to have a television credit. Um, as far as magic shows to be on, on television, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Fool Us is the best one. Yeah. Uh, they just, you know, I, I knew going in from Francis, uh, when I, that they, they focus on featuring and making magic look really good. Like that's the purpose of the show. Yeah. The purpose of anyone who thinks that Fool Us is about going on to fool them has completely missed the mark. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's about going on to showcase yourself and your magic and and give people like a little beautiful package of who you are as a performer. Mm. Uh, there's not even things like AGT don't allow for the same care and consideration of presentation that I think Fool Us does. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Uh, so as someone who is a longtime performer, but newer in the world of magic, I thought it would be really beneficial to go on the show. I actually applied the first time in 2019 with the same trick that I did when I got on in 2020. Okay. Um, or I applied in 2019, didn't get on for the 2020 season, but Francis did. And then in 2020, I applied again and got on in 2021. Okay. And he, um, he was on, he came back for season seven. Like the, he was, he was part of the first pandemic filmed in a bubble season, right? No. Oh, okay. Okay. No, he was the last season the, where they had an audience. Right. And that, they were filming that just as things were starting to get, look bad. Like I remember there were some, Crazy. some people who like had a hard time getting home because they were wrapping yeah. up. Yeah. It was, yeah, we were on the last day. It was, or he was on the last day. It was okay. ridiculous. Uh, they were like closing up Vegas as so we were getting on yeah. the plane. That's um, crazy. It was that's a, that's a, 2020 is such a weird, weird year. There's so <laughs> many gaps in memory. Yeah. It also yeah. feels like it was a million years ago and also last year. Yep. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Weird weird times and yeah it is um, weird for, for me when i'm saying something so so I, I my first fool us was filmed um in october of 2020 so i i, I was part of 7b which was in the production weird. bubble yeah 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 um and uh but it is weird like i still do that routine in my show and i talk about uh you know recording it and then i'm like wow that was three years ago like that really it uh, it does not seem like, I mean, obviously October, but still the, the fact that things shut down uh, just over three years ago now, it, it, you're right. It feels like a lifetime ago, but also like it hasn't been three years, has it? So yeah. very, very strange. Uh, the time is all messed up for all of us, you know? <laughs> yeah. It, and we all like aged one year, but also 10 years. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's very bizarre. Um, I... I don't, it's funny you say that I don't do my, my piece from Fool Us anymore. Okay. I haven't done it basically since I did Fool Us. Okay. Is um, there a reason, did you de develop it for Fool Us or is there a reason it, for that? I developed it for Fool Us. Okay. Um, and well, I had a, a, an actual living nightmare experience filming Fool Us. And not to, not that it was anyone's fault. Sure. No one did anything, you know, no, this is like, the production is great. I, I still, I have still applied again to go back on. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. It's 
encourage me and I don't, I don't want to discourage anyone from doing it. So I, I usually like, I try to give the disclaimer of like, it was just a, a real lemony snicket situation. Right. Yeah. Uh, as far as a, se- a series of unfortunate events. Sure. Um, so when I filmed, I don't know if this was like this for you, but they had me rehearse and then shoot like two minutes later. Yes. Same. There was no break. Right, mm-hmm. because they're trying to minimize how many people you're interacting with. Right. So, I am so excited. I have worked with the director. I've worked with a script writer. I've been rehearsing every day. I've been doing so much work to make sure, especially because I was filming in uh, June of 2021. I hadn't done live performances, really, right. other than, like, virtually. I was not... This is a piece that was barely getting any stage time at this time. Because I couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was super nervous. I worked so hard on this piece to the point where I could do it in my sleep. Okay. But that's great. I'm so glad I rehearsed so much. Because when it came time to do it, uh, it went horribly wrong. Oh, no. Uh, in my rehearsal, uh, I uh, so I was, okay, so. Because of my background in film and television, when I looked at the schedule and it told me I was going to film at 8.30 at night, mm. I tried to be a little sneaky Sally and be like, hey, I'm going to be so tired because like, I'm from the East Coast sure. and that's going to be so late. Like, can I, Is there any way I can go earlier because it's going to feel like 11.30 at night? They're like, there's no way. And I was like, strike one. All right, I tried. And you know, yeah. I just quickly accepted. I was like, okay, I just tried. It didn't work. Um, so I go out to film. I am literally the last act on for the day. Oh, uh, yeah. And everybody is exhausted because I, again, I know what the film world is like. Everyone is freaking so tired now. The stand-ins are tired. The producers are tired. Penn and Teller are tired. Everyone is tired. Everyone is ready to be like, let's get her done so we can leave. Yeah, yeah. Which is fair and fine. And it's not personal. Um, but the stand-ins were tired. Yeah. And while it wasn't personal, uh, I get through my whole piece. My rehearsal goes great. I'm feeling really good. My energy's up. I was like, man, I got it. I'm so re- I'm so excited. That rehearsal felt great. Mm-hmm. All right. According to this thought bubble, your word, the picture you had is this. And they both of the stand-ins just look at me and go, I don't know. <laughs> what? And I was like, what? What do you mean you don't know? So I unfold the paper and it says hello in the thought bubble. And I was just like, What, what, how did this, Huh? did you, and then I just had to stand there internally freaking out and also simultaneously being like, Lindsay, don't cry. (laughs) Yeah, right, right, right. Don't cry. And I'm like, how did I mess this up? I don't know how I did this wrong. I did, this has worked every other time I've done it. I don't understand what happened. I somehow messed this up. How do I adjust this in like two minutes? Right. I had to stand there on the on the sound stage with the producer voice of God talking about the like changing this and that. And yeah. da, 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 and okay, go back and reset. We're gonna do it. And when I get really nervous, uh, I get like a ringing in one ear, and then my whole ear is clogged, and I can only hear my own voice. Oh yeah, that happened. Um, and I tried to uh, shake it out, right? Like that theater exercise, where you're like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, and you get down until your shit, and on one, you just one, 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 one. One, one, you shake your whole body. Yeah. Which is super helpful. It's great. It like recenters you. You kind of you kind of feel like you're okay again and you can go in and like reset. It's great. Yeah. Unless, of course, you see, you have your bubbles in your pocket. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, for our for our friends, for our friends here listening, um, if you don't know this about bubbles, if you shake bubbles, they do not work. Uh, foam yeah. makes bubbles not work. Right. Uh, so I had shaken the ever loving uh, sugar out of these bubbles in my pocket. Right. Guys. And uh, something else that's fun about filming in the pandemic is that you're not doing it with just random audience people. You're doing your magic trick like with Teller sure. and Allison Hannigan. You know, just like two normal human beings that definitely I'm not oh. like a little nervous in front of. Totally. Yeah. 
So I actually don't remember any part of my filming. <laughs> it was like the, my brain was like, we're just going to survive. Yeah. Uh, the only part that I remember is that when it came time for me to have Teller blow a bubble, I had to do it eight times. Uh. Eight times. And this is really a testament to how good Fulas is and how well they treat their magicians because... <laughs> If you watch this video, you don't, you would not know any of the things I'm saying. You wouldn't know that I was internally dying. <laughs> um, oh. You wouldn't know that my bubbles didn't work. Yeah. You wouldn't know any of these things because they do, they take a lot of care to edit and present people in a way that's, that's flattering. Sure. As possible. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, and that is uh, amazing of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just, and this is, I'm so glad I came from the world of film and, film and television because I was at least aware that if I just take a breath and yeah. reset, it would be fine. So I would, the line that I said, I think I say is, um, slow and steady whenever you're ready. And then I bring the bubble wand up to Teller's face. Yeah. Uh, I just, it would not work. And then I would take a breath and go. Slow and steady whenever you're ready. And I right. did that exact thing eight times over. By the sixth time, it didn't work. And I was just like, <laughs> can someone bring me the other bottle of bubbles? There's another bottle of bubbles. And they were like, intercom beep. Yeah. Going. Oh, no. I was like, okay. Were they just enjoying that in the truck? Like They're like, oh, let's, they had bets on like, I got money on 12. <laughs> no, oh my God. No, I think, I'm pretty sure. But when you're watching that, also all the crew at that point is like, oh my God, well, this woman's bubbles just work so we can be done. Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, it obviously it eventually worked. It's fine. And I always uh I've talked about this in uh a, a Francis and I have a sort of lecture slash show thing we put together mm. uh for conventions. And I talk about this in that uh specifically on the importance of rehearsing and working with a director. Okay. Uh because while internally I was freaking out and I don't have any actual memory of my filming, um, you can't tell that in the video. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. You were on autopilot enough. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's all thank you to rehearsing. Like that is because I knew this piece inside and out. There was no way to get it wrong. Yeah. Right. So it's yes. I think, uh, that the takeaway here is work with a hire a director and not a magician. Right. Hire a theater director to work with you. It right. will change how you approach your breathing. Um, your everything you do about your presentation will be better. Right. Yes. Uh, no, I, I think, think yeah. That's great advice. I mean, like, yeah, you the first tier is looking at yourself in the mirror while you do the thing. But then even then you can't be both the actor and the, the perform, you know, or the, the cr critic. So then the next layer is film it. And that way you're able to be the performer and then be the critic. But yeah, you really need other sets of eyes. And, and I, I, I totally agree. Like sets of eyes that are, are not from a magician perspective um, are super helpful because we might be hung up on things because we know too much or because we have baggage of tropes and, and such uh, from, from magic. So being able to see that in fresh eyes is, is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think theater directors um, and you can, and, and if, if anyone listens to this and says, Oh man, I should work with a theater director. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I have someone I work with who is amazing and I highly recommend her. Uh, awesome. She can also help you virtually and uh, she loves working with magicians. So she is used to working with magicians. Right. Okay. She really, because there's, you know, there's going to be parts where you'll have to explain some stuff to this director you're working with, right. but that, like you can say, you know, you're going to get different perspectives on how to present things. And they're going to, I think it's one of the things that I'm jumping around a little bit, but I think it's one of the things that makes me stand out in magic is that I don't approach magic like a magician. Okay. I approach magic like an entertainer. Okay. Right. So I am not. I don't want to be the best card technician. Right. I want to create a magical moment that only I could make. Okay. Yeah. Right? And I think directors can also help you figure out 
what that is about yourself that you can bring that isn't just a card technician uh, title, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, and and they will help you to realize those goals. I mean, that that you you know your goal should not be I want to trick people with this really good sleight of hand. That but but we all have friends in magic who that that's sort of where the thinking stops you know there there i i've i've i'm able to do this move and people cannot tell what i'm doing i'm done you know who cares uh, right yeah that's that's yeah. that's when the work begins <laughs> correct um, yeah that and that's the thing that's step one is your trick works like yeah you have to have that part sure sure but what are you doing with it from there yeah no 100 percent. i agreed and it's and i think I think that also we're in a lucky position where um, many audiences don't expect that from a magic show. And, and that's a whole nother can of worms. But when we can give them that from a magic show, uh, it's a really lovely surprise that they weren't expecting. Uh, so that's a, it, I, I would, on the one hand, I hope that we can elevate the art more than it has been in the past, but at the same time, if we are bringing a, a, another goal to it beyond just, did we fool you? Uh, then people are going home with something uh, special from us. So uh, I, I'm totally with you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, magic should be special. It's something that, I mean, Francis was, and I were talking about this the other day. Mm -hmm. How many people in the general population have even seen a live magic show before have seen a magic trick in front of their own eyes. Yeah. So like already that is something different and unique. But if you can then go a step further with it, you're going to be in that person's mind forever. Yep. Yeah. No, hundred percent. I mean, and that's, I, I, I think that we also like you and I see a lot more magic than the average person, but, um, that is part of what bothers me when I go to see a show that is, um, you know, let's say below standard, um, uh, <laughs> not, not above standard. Uh, and, and it, it, what bothers me about it is that, uh, for a lot of people in the audience, this is one of their three or four touchstones in their life, possibly of what a magic show is. And it just, it bums right. me out, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. but again, that the only thing we can do is, is try to, you know, put more, uh, better magic in the world and, and cross our fingers that, that uh, the rising tide raises all ships, you know? So that is, I do hope for that. And I, I see more of it. I see more of a focus on it mm. now. Um, even, you know, it's funny. Um, I have a lecture on styling for magicians okay. and it's not, it's not tricks. It's not a trick lecture. You're not going to walk away with four new effects involving your clothes. No, yeah. it's literally, I'm going to give you information that you're not going to be able to just easily seek, seek and find. And I, I don't know. There's more like when I go to a magic lecture, sure. Do I like to learn tricks? I guess. Yeah. But I'm, much more interested in the theory because I feel like the theory gives you so many, the theory is a tool that has so many more uses right. than this one singular effect. I uh, agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. So let I want to talk more about style and what, especially styling for magicians. Like, what do you think, what are some of the common pitfalls or what, are, what are some of the, like, you know, one or two golden pieces of advice that when you share it with magicians, you get a lot of light bulb moments. Don't wear all black. <laughs> Don't. That's for the backstage crew, not you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are there people that can pull it off? Absolutely. You know who looks really cool and great in all black? Rachel Wax. Oh yeah. Uh huh. She, but she is. She comes from fashion background. She understands the garments she's wearing, and she's also wearing things that are cut in such an interesting. Like she just knows what she's doing. Yeah. She can break that rule because she knows that right. Yeah. Like. She knows what she's doing. Um, but your average magician in all black yeah. looks, you, you're invisible. Yep. And I guess, and how many of them are actually using it for black art? I promise you not as many as are dressed in all black. No, no. Not no. probably half of them. Right? Yeah. So like, I don't know. If you really need to do watch this live in front of people, uh, and I don't do people know that do people know what the watch this gimmick is. I feel like it got huge over the pandemic. Oh yeah. I mean, the watch thing, or the watch becomes a card. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and for our, if, if our listener is not a magician, just the idea that there are tricks that require a dark colored background. Um, and then that it, it becomes advantageous sometimes if you're wearing a dark colored top or, you know, that, to do the trick in front of, 
but yeah, I agree. That's not, that's not the, that, that's that, that happens so infrequently for, compared to the number of people wearing all black. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah. not just, okay. So not only are you now sort of disappearing, a lot of these places you're going to perform are going to be on a dark background. So you're going to blend into that. Yep. And you look like every other magician. Yeah. You look like everybody else. I also, I am pretty against the whole, uh, well, actually, before I say this, what is your what is your magician's outfit? What do you wear, Peter? No, I was I, I, <laughs> I was thinking this would make for really great podcast material. If you're like, I just really the if if you're wearing a tie and a vest and rolled up sleeves, you're just not even you're not. And I'm like, I'm actually I, I uh, you know, <laughs> do you yeah. actually wear a dress shirt and a vest? Yes. Yeah, so so my um my my default is going to be a um a vest with lapels and a tie and a uh you know a a dress shirt with rolled up sleeves um because i want that sort of and again my show is also um it's not a period show but everything looks like it could have existed a hundred years ago so already that about you aesthetically you you do a good job of your branding i actually did i didn't know exactly what you wore but i knew your vibe was like Turn of the century magician. Right. Totally. Right. Yeah. But the, yeah. Like also like your, uh, your museum of the impossible and all of that stuff. You can see that inspiration and that, uh, leading in it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. so that's, so, all right. So as, now you should tell me the official stop wearing, uh, <laughs> well, I do usually say, are you, don't just wear a dress shirt and a vest. That's what literally everybody wears. Because um, a lot of guys, a lot of guys look like they they're going to prom like the 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 vest that they're wearing is just a sort of metallic bright color vest and and it just came from a tuck shop you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and that's not interesting and and you know it's funny because i was gonna you you did it before i could ask you mm. but typically when i start with a styling client i will say what do you normally wear uh. tell me and I say, why mm. Uh, you had a great reason. So therefore you kind of are, you, you then can remove yourself from, you should not wear that vest and shirt because yep. you have an actual reason. And as far as the period thing goes, like it does, it fits. You should be doing that court sort of thing to have that weird, the vest with the lapel specifically is what's setting you into that right. era that you're A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you have thought about that and therefore it's part of your character. I think a lot of people don't think about the character so much as they're like, this is just what magicians wear. Yep. But if that's what you think magicians wear, why do you want to look like every magician? That's yeah, no, that's fair. And, and also just thinking, I mean, it's the whole playing card tie thing. Like I do tricks with cards. I found this card, this tie with cards on it. I'm done. I'm done thinking. And, and that's, you know, Johnny Thompson famously saying magicians stop thinking too soon. Uh, so yeah, I, I oh, agreed. That's true. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, so typically, if you don't, I guess, I guess the the advice is stop wearing a dress shirt and a vest uh, and a tie if you don't have a reason. If there's not right. a reason for your character to wear those things, that's not interesting. But there's also then a larger discussion to be had of like, who is your character? Right. What do you want the clothes to say about you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because that is when we step out on stage. That's the first impression. That visual that you're showing is who right. you are in that exact moment. And people are judgmental and people are quick to uh, draw conclusions. Yeah. What do you want those conclusions to be? Yeah, it's I not, think. I'm sure it's not just, hey, that's just some magician. He's wearing a vest and a, a shirt, you know? Right. When, and I kind of have more respect. And tell me if this is true for you, too. If someone makes a bold choice and it it, it isn't my cup of tea, I still respect them for making a bold choice. Like I can tell that they put thought and effort into it, even if I feel like they missed the mark, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And I, I don't give unsolicited advice. It's something that took me a long time to learn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I'm like, Oh, I can help. But unless someone asks you for your help, they don't. It's hard. So, yes. So now I, I don't just offer it without being asked. But if I'm asked by that person, I would then be like, well, I see what you're doing here. What if you explored, you did that same thing, but explored it in this way. Yep. Um, I'm also a big fan of considering textures, not patterns, but textures. Cool. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said for playing in the same color with different kinds of fabrics. Interesting. Yeah. I, there's just like, there's a lot. 
and it's it's hard to i think um menswear gets a rap for being just kind of all the same thing mm -hmm. but there are small elements you can adjust sure right um even if you want to play with and this is something else that i kind of talk about when i lecture which is that um i am not fashionable okay i am not I've never been those things, but I don't think fashion and trend are where you want to live. I think style is where you want to exist. Interesting. Because a personal style can remain timeless. You can play around with the trends and new fashions, which I, I do. I, I love to be like, oh, this new thing is in. Let me see if I can revisit things in my closet or go to a thrift store and sort of play with some of these things, uh, these shapes. Like for uh, for instance, right now, we're in uh, late '90s, early 2000s inspired. Everything is oversized, right, right? Right. Which personally, I don't love. Uh -huh. But when I was younger, when I was uh, what the first time this was in fashion, when I was in my when I was like preteen, uh, teen, early teen, preteen, um, I didn't understand fashion that well. I didn't understand style that well. So I am having a lot of fun playing around with these trends that have that are cyclical that have come back because right. now I feel like I have an understanding of how to dress and drape my own body. And also I can, I have the knowledge of just where to find pieces, where to source things and how to kind of, you know, take something that I have in my closet and maybe re sew it. So it's more in the shape of the era. But if you, I would still say that even if I'm playing with that, those things, I still have a personal style that, has a similar vein all the way through of like basically if you went back to like the time i was 20 to now like i feel like i've had something uh, some version of a personal style cool. through life since then yeah and, and and i think that also helps you you're not just going to jump on the bandwagon of whatever is trending right now and and you but, but you know but i like the the thought of still being in touch with that and and seeing how you can sort of pull from your existing wardrobe to, to let people know that you are, are aware of the world around you, but at the same time, you're not just turning into a chameleon every few years. Right. But that said, uh, any, any, um, male magicians or people that dress or magicians that dress more masculine, oh. uh, I will just let you know that the skinny profile pant is, is very much out right now. You will, <laughs> it, it does date you. That is the thing that right now, currently, if you wear a pant, that's super skinny cut, uh, you, you, it, it makes you look like you're trying to be cool 10 years ago. Yeah. I think, I think that's another, I, I'm, I'm, I feel lucky that I've never tried to be cool on stage. <laughs> um, <laughs> like my, that has never been my jam. And even at the time when it was all Copperfield and world's greatest magic, and a lot of my colleagues were trying to dress like Copperfield or David Blaine or Chris oh, Angel. They put on the back butters right yeah oh i mean yeah that I, I do i have my david copperfield outfit what, what i say when i'm wearing blue jeans and a giant baggy black sweatshirt uh that is the copperfield flying costume you know um <laughs> but uh and it looks it's very it's very you know 90s um yeah. but but yeah there is something sort of freeing about like uh, b because because i have the old-fashioned vibe it's kind of like it is it is always outdated in that it's from another time kind of, you know, um, that keeps it safe from looking dated. Right. right. Like cause outdated and dated are two different things. And I feel like outdated can reference being a period thing, whereas dated specifically is like you're trying to be cool 10 years ago. Right. I feel like that's always how the that's that's contextually how I think of it. No, that that's very interesting. I mean, I, I don't think about outdated is <clears throat> it, it doesn't have nearly the negative connotation as dated. So yeah, I, I, I think right, exactly. Yeah, that that's yeah. Well, I, I think um I think more magicians should be thinking about that. And so I'm I'm this was this has been a lot of fun chatting about it. And hopefully, even if our, our friend listening is not a magician, just sort of realizing that there are those among us in the performing arts who are thinking about it on that on that level and not just. Uh, I'm I'm gonna put on a, a a bow tie and a tux because that's what I've seen other people do, you know. Um, and don't but. listen. I'm not saying don't wear a tuxedo. Sure. But as the woman who loves a tuxedo, have at it. Yeah, well, I, I think just just like 
make a choice, right? Like just, yeah. just thinking about it. And, and if, um, if you haven't thought about it at all, then, then you should. And again, I, I still have more respect for somebody who makes a crazy choice that is not my jam, but, but they're, they're clearly picking a lane, you know? So that's, yes. that's great. Um, yeah. Agreed. Well, well, I, I, I can't thank you enough for, for coming to hanging out here with me. This is great. Um, I do want to make sure for anyone who's watching, they've been seeing on the screen the whole time, but for our, our listeners, um, uh, if they want to follow your adventures on social media, uh, Lindsay Noel magic is the best place. Uh, certainly on uh, Instagram again, that's Lindsay yeah. with an E, uh, yeah. and then, um, Lindsay Noel, and then an underscore is going to be your on, on Twitter. Um, yeah. and then, uh, the, but the main hub for everything, Lindsay Noel magic.com folks can, find out about um, uh, your monthly magic above standard and um, any other sort of public appearance type stuff. But also that's a great place for them to find your, your socials. Um, you, can find out, you can find everything on my website. You can even sign up for my newsletter that I've sent out one time in three years. Awesome. That's, <laughs> that's okay. So we're going to add that by the time someone listens to this, you will not only have a full gallery of, <laughs> of your posters on your website, but you'll also be sending out another newsletter really soon, right? So. Yeah, really soon. Sign up. <laughs> it's good. It's good to have a goal. That's great. <laughs> well, listening, you can't see I'm winking a lot. Yes. Yeah. It's like, like, like you're, <laughs> like you're putting in a contact lens. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, again, I, I appreciate it. And thank you for our, our friend listening here. Uh, that is going to do it for this episode of the podcast of the impossible. Uh, but for behind the scenes access to my museum of the impossible project, as well as info about my public shows and private events and social media and all that stuff, you can head on over to peterwood.com. I'm Peter Wood. Thanks. Thanks.